do come to AI from a very particular angle. When people think about AI, they think about technology, they think about maybe ethics, they maybe think about industries, but you come at it through a lens of economics because you're an economist. So what is the framing through which you like to discuss AI and the impact that AI can have? So certainly the lens that uh, I speak about AI and work on AI is through, uh, uh, through economics. And that gives us a little bit of a unique vantage point because so many people who talk about AI are either practitioners, and so they're coming at it from computer science point of view, uh, or uh, futurists, you know, science fiction writers and, and um, people like that, uh, both of which have very valuable things to say. Uh, but economics gives us a, a, you know, it's a, different, it's a different lens. And the basic idea in economics uh, for not just AI, but for any technology is is to reduce all of the complexities of the technology down to a single question, and that, and that question is, what does this reduce the cost of? So semiconductors reduces the cost of arithmetic, uh, internet reduces the cost of search and the dis uh, digital distribution of goods and services, and AI reduces the cost of prediction. And that seems very simple, um, and it is, uh, but as soon as you turn it into that, uh, then you can bring a hundred years of tools from the discipline in economics to say, okay, now we've got a thing that we understand uh, because we have a pretty good handle of what prediction is. And so it's making prediction cheap. And so, you know, what do we anticipate are, the, are all of the uh, implications uh, for business and society when this thing becomes cheap? Right, and, and the, the meta thing is decisions, powers, uh, power uh, you know, is decided upon by the decisions you make, and in as much as uh, AI can help with decision making, it's bifurcated. There is prediction and there's judgment. Um, so where does AI come in in that bifurcation with the prediction side and the judgment side? Yeah, so you can, most of us don't think about this when you're making a decision, but every decision you make has uh, an element of prediction and judgment. So for example, if you are going out, uh, let's say right now we're here in Toronto, we look outside and the, and the sky is overcast. And so if, if um, you wanted to walk uh, to say Union Station and you thought, okay, you, as you're walking out the door, should I, should I grab an umbrella? And it seems like a small decision. Um, and my guess is uh, just by show of hands, how many people just looking outside would take an umbrella? Anybody? One? Okay, so one person would take an umbrella. In an, in an average room, maybe it'd be like, you know, 20, 30% on a day like they would take an umbrella. And that is a function of two things. One is you look outside and you get a probability of what's the likelihood it's going to rain. And, I, and, and then the second is the judgment, which is what's the cost if I make a mistake? So um, those are the two things. And so, uh, Someone might take an umbrella either because they look out and they say, oh, I think this is a lower chance of rain, or they say, I'll take the umbrella because I, maybe I think it's the same chance of rain as everyone else here. So let's say it's 10% chance of rain, but I care more if I get wet than they do. And so there's no right and wrong answer. It's just those are the two bits. Um, and I've given a very simple decision of, of taking an umbrella, but that's a, that's a trillion dollar decision category. That's insurance. An umbrella is basically just, it's a, it's a form of insurance uh, where basically, you know, you, you bear a cost of schlepping this thing around in the event of the bad outcome. Just like you buy home insurance. Most people buy home insurance, hopefully never need it. Uh, just like you maybe, hopefully you don't need the umbrella, but you take it. Uh, some people take it in the event of the bad outcome. Anyway, so prediction, uh, uh, AI does the prediction part and human does the judgment part. So we have an AI that can predict, you know, directions or predict whether a financial transactions fraudulent or not, or predict in drug discovery um, which molecule will most effectively bind with which protein. Uh, and then there's the judgment uh, of how do we weigh the, the effectively think of it simply as the cost of a mistake. And that part, there has been zero progress in terms of like when people say, oh, you know, these AIs are making decisions. AIs make zero decisions. They do prediction. It, they can give the illusion of making decisions because a human can have coded their judgment. And so, the, so it looks like the machine's making a decision, but really what the machine is doing is this, is this generating a prediction 
And then before it can make the decision, it has to access the judgment, and that either comes from a person's head or a person has, has uh, dumped it into the machine. And so when that happens, um, you know, you can decouple the decision from the decision maker. So I, I was just at a very, um, like a, quite a significant conference for uh, global security. And our uh, Minister of Defense was there, uh, the Secretary of Defense from the US was there, a number of other uh, NATO countries. And there was a panel where a number of people in the panel were talking about drones, uh, autonomous drones making kill decisions. It's not true, like no drone makes any decision. But it can give the illusion of making a decision because let's say someone in Washington has, has coded their judgment and said, okay, if you're 99% sure that that is the target, then fire. Uh, but that was not a decision made by the machine. That was a person who put their judgment in there and said 99%, so that's the cutoff. If you're that confident, um, then go ahead. Right, okay, so zero progress on, on the judgment part, but a lot of progress in the prediction part. And you bring up the example of weather, which is like the example everyone kind of gives, it, like, oh, what, what are the things you need to predict? The weather, uh, gambling, sports, but what's the most farthest of field industry uh, where prediction is gonna change uh, how they do things at scale with AI? A, a surprising industry where AI-enabled prediction will just make things better or faster. So first of all, I would say I have yet to find any industry where it's not having an impact. It's been one of the, the fun things about Lavin is that Lavin sends me out to all these you know, different events to speak to groups that I would never otherwise get to see. So an interesting one was the cement industry in Boston. I went out to a conference of people that were in the cement industry and they wanted a presentation on AI and I did. And uh, before that happened, we, we had a dinner and I asked the people at the dinner, uh, where do they think this can, can be, like utilized in the industry? And they just started listing all these areas. So here's one interesting one, is when the cement trucks are going from the, uh, you know, where they pick up their, uh, their load to the construction site, um, it's very important that the cement stays in a particular state. Uh, and so, like it can't get too wet, but it can't get too dry. If it dries, it sets. And so when they get to the job site and they drop off the cement, if it, if it doesn't meet the code of the range of uh, basically moisture that's it's supposed to be, then they have to take the whole thing back. And so as they're driving, the machine's driving, uh, you know how the, the bucket turns as it's going? Uh, they need to effectively predict uh, what's happening inside the bucket and do they need to uh, put more water or chemicals in to keep the, the um, slurry in, its, in, the, in the appropriate state. So that's just, just one example that they were using uh, this as a, you know, they put sensors inside there and basically make predictions uh, as they're going. And they said that they, it can increase the productivity um, in terms of, of reduced rejected loads uh, by up to 10%. Right, and that's important for the cement industry to know. It's very important. And you know what's interesting is so much of society, and I'm gonna tell you this thing and at the time, when I tell you, at first you're going to feel like, okay, that's this sort of an interesting, but it's an oddball thing, and it's not really that important. And then I promise you, you will start thinking about this everywhere you go and everything you see. Um, it's one of those. It's just one of those funny things, which is, we have constructed a society where we've optimized around the uh, around uncertainty, and. Because we can't resolve uncertainty, we, we've engineered around it. And, um, and we're so used to it, we don't even think about it. But, uh, you know, and you saw at, at the presentation, uh, um, at the book launch, that, you know, probably the most fantastic example are these incredible new airports, particularly in Asia, like multi-billion dollar airports, just beautiful structures. And, you think about like why? Because an airport is not really meant to be a destination where you go and shop and stay. It's there because you're you know going to get on a plane to go somewhere. And um, and what's interesting is that the reason that there's so much luxury is because people have so much time to kill. And the reason they have so much time to kill is because 
that infrastructure has been created to deal with the uncertainty of not knowing when the plane's gonna take off. So we all get there early, and then we have the time there. And so, you know, airports are a monument to uncertainty. If you could reduce the uncertainty, whoosh, airport would go away. And the, and the way you know that's true is because airports are this very interesting example where like the most expensive name brands like Gucci and Prada and so on are full, like they're all over those airports, but go to where the most wealthy people go, like where they, you know, uh, like a terminal for a private jet, no Gucci, no Prada. Wow. If you've ever been to a terminal for the private jet, there's nothing there. And the reason is because they don't have to wait. They arrive, they drive up, and then they you know, climb out of their limo, uh, and they climb up the stairs and into their plane and they're gone. And so there is literally nothing there. It's like there's a small fridge with some bottles of water and a coffee machine, and that's it. Uh, because they, they don't need to wait. And so you, if you sort of just go around society, like, uh, like through a city and through your daily life, and you think of all the things we have done to engineer around uncertainty, and then you think, now this new thing has dropped down from the sky. That is, you can think of it as an uncertainty resolution machine. And so for a wide range of things, it can reduce uncertainty. And so all of all the things we've built that have been designed to, to engineer and protect us from uncertainty um, are not necessary. Uh, um, but you can't kind of pull them out piecemeal. You have to redesign the system. And that's what the new book is about. The first book was about what we call point solutions, which is the, the things where you can just surgically go in and take out some old prediction tool and put in this new prediction tool, but the rest of the system stays the same. Examples of that are things like fraud detection at banks, um, claims verification at insurance companies, uh, uh, recommendation engines uh, online. So all those things, system existed, and you can just pull out the old predictive analytics, drop in the new AI, and the whole rest of the system stays the same. But um, what we can, you know, the big opportunity, and that the first book was about those point solutions, but the big opportunity, the second book, is about, okay, wait a minute, what if we redesign the whole system? Uh, because so much of the system has been optimized for a world that had no way to resolve uncertainty. Right, right. So just to recap, the, the point solution is the system is entrenched. It's a legacy system. It's decades, if not hundreds of years old. AI can help in as much as it helps do one thing better. Oh my God, we can now do this with ease. But the system fundamentally remains the same. The second book is about how AI on scale can change the system. So uh, it's an elaborate story, but I'm wondering if you could tell the story about the knowledge uh, in London and how that's actually a perfect example of a point solution versus uh, a system-wide change. Sure, yeah, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a really good way to illustrate uh, the point solution versus system solution and also book one versus book two. So the idea here is, um, you know, every time you open up your um, Waze or Google Maps or something, um, that's an AI that's predicting how to get from one point to another and telling you the best route. And it's a quite a remarkable AI in the sense that uh, what Charles was describing was uh, this thing called the knowledge, uh, which is if you want to get a taxi license in the city of London, you have to go to school for three years. Uh, and, and you study uh, what they call the knowledge. And, and so you do your first year studying maps the, of the city of London. Second year, you get on a moped and you drive around and you learn all the streets. And the third year is a mix of maps and mopeds. And at the end of that, you get an exam. And the exam has a whole bunch of questions that are something like it's four o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon in November and your passenger wants to go from the Churchill War Rooms to the Royal Botanical Gardens, what's the fastest route? And so you have to just recite what's the fastest route. And then they'll do a bunch of those types of questions. Now today, you and I can just you know, fly into Heathrow, rent a car, we've never been to London, and open up your, your uh, navigational AI, and you can drive as well as, you know, navigate as well as, as a person who studied for three years. So if we gave that AI to taxi drivers to make them more efficient, that's a point solution. The whole taxi system stays the same, but now you've got an AI that takes the less experienced taxi drivers and it gives them a, a, a boost so they become as good as the more, more experienced taxi drivers. A system solution is one that everyone here has seen and probably tried and that's Uber. 
where they said, wait a minute, if we can reduce the uncertainty, and there's actually two parts to the other, there's two AIs in the taxi business. There's a few, but these are the two main ones. One is the one, I, you know, the navigational, predicting the best route. The other is when your taxi's empty, predicting where to go to reduce the time to, to pick up a new passenger. If you're a taxi driver, on average, taxi drivers spend 50% of their time with nobody in their taxi. So they're not making any money. So the more they can shorten the time, then the more productive they can be and, and, earn, and earn more income. So uh, these two AIs, one to predict where to go, what they call a demand forecasting AI and a navigational AI. Uber says, wait a minute, we could, now that we have these two AIs, what if we were just to redesign the whole system? So instead of taking a trained taxi driver, let's say who's gone to school for three years and making them you know, from a, a less experienced but still professional driver to a more you know, uh, experienced driver, we could take the same technology and take a person who doesn't know the city at all and make them as, as competent as a, as a taxi driver. And so in the case of Uber, like now there's about somewhere between three and five million Uber drivers in the US, so just one company. So think about all the labor. So there's roughly about 200,000 in, in 2018, there was about uh, 200,000 professional taxi and limo drivers in the US. So now there are over two million, so more than 10 times as much, about, like I say, between three and a half and five million, uh, just for Uber, that's not counting Lyft and, and any of the others. So it unleashed this incredible labor force. Furthermore, in addition to the labor force, over $100 billion in uh, capital assets, like all the cars. So all those cars that were sitting underutilized in people's driveways and car parks and on, you know, on the curbside, uh, all of a sudden got unlocked to create a, a transportation system that was uh, just foundationally different than no matter how much you tooled up a taxi driver. Um, so that's a system change. So what we realized, you know, uh, and frankly, you know, I, um, uh, Lavin was a great help in this because when we published the first book, we were focused on point systems, point solutions. And as we went around and we talked to people and we started getting feedback from different industries. And, um, and that's when we realized, wait a minute, we've missed a big part of the story. It's still quite rare. Uh, the reason that I, talk, I, I give the Uber example is because Uber is a superb example, but there's not a lot of others. And I think part of that is that um, redesigning a full system from scratch very hard. There's a lot of resistance. In the case of Uber, there was a, a real maverick, and some people you know, find, uh, take some offense to tra uh, Travis Kalanick, who's the CEO of Uber. Uh, he knocked down a lot of walls. Uh, he operated in the gray zone of the law quite a bit. In some cases, people say he went over the line. In a lot of cities, tried to keep Uber out. Uh, but in other words, that gives us a flavor of what it takes to redesign a system and, be, and, and kind of topple a very entrenched existing system. The AI is just one piece. Think of all the elements you need to make Uber go. The AI is just one puzzle piece. Right. And Uber is a good example because, as you point out, it's highly imperfect. People actually probably hate Uber more than they like Uber, even if they literally uh, use Uber. So um, is the example and the reasons they hate Uber are maybe beyond the fact that they have a good AI. But uh, when other companies look to this example or how to how to break out or grow, like what are the things to look out for that Uber did wrong? Because the technology was good. And maybe you can't speak to this because this is about organizational culture, but you know, what would the next Uber do a little better than Uber? Well, I've seen, for example, you know, when you think about AI being a tool to, to resolve uncertainty, um, the industry that in some sense is, is ground zero for uncertainty is the insurance industry because that's, what, that's all they do. All they do is they focus on uncertainty and they try and price it and measure it. So uh, I'll give you an example from insurance. Um, let me start by asking you, like, imagine that you went to the doctor for your annual checkup. The doctor you know, does, a, does a thorough exam, and at the end of it says, oh, Charles, I'm, I'm very sorry. 
uh, I don't. I think uh, you're you're going to be in rough shape in a couple of years. Anyhow, nice to see you. Uh, we'll see you next year at your checkup. And and you would say, wait, wait, what? Uh, aren't you going to tell me what's the matter? Are you, are you going to tell me how to fix it? And the, imagine the doctor says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to fix it. I'll see you next year. So you would think that's crazy. Um, and it is crazy. But that is what the insurance industry does all the time. So if you and I, let's say both went to get house insurance, and, and, and I got quoted for a premium that was 25% higher than your premium, that's because the insurance company predicts that I'm more like, my house is more likely to get sick than yours. In their world, sick means filing a claim. So something's wrong, and so you file a claim. And so the reason they charge me more than you is because they are predicting that I'm more, I'm more like my house is more likely to have a problem. And now their predictions have gotten so good that they can get to what they call a sub peril level. So that means they can predict that the reason you're going to submit a claim is because, for example, an, uh, an electrical fire. Like you have a higher chance. I have a higher chance of an electrical fire than Charles. Or uh, what they call water non-weather. Water non-weather means like a uh, leaky pipe, let's say that floods your basement. So imagine that, that they can predict with that kind of fidelity because they have a bunch of information. They know in my neighborhood, like the, the average age of a home, the average type of a pipe, like am I, are, are, are my houses in my neighborhood using knob and tube? Uh, they probably have satellite imagery data. They can look at my roof and they know how, how recently we've done repairs. Uh, if if, for example, someone's come into my home, uh, let's say if I bought my home within a certain number of years, there might have been a home inspection. If they get the home inspection data, they can make even more predictions because now there's an inspector that's been in and, and, and maybe commented on the appliances or whatever. So now they have super high fidelity. They have a better prediction than I knew of my own house. Now, out in the world, there's a bunch of, of, of risk mitigation tools. Like you can buy a, a device that you plug into your wall and it measures electrical current and it can predict the likelihood of an electrical fire. And it can predict if that likelihood goes up. Same thing, you can put a sensor in your um, pipes and that can give you early detection of a uh, leak. So you can hook up an AI to these sensors getting data uh, in and, and make predictions. Now the thing is from, from their perspective, they have a much better idea. So imagine you and I are watching late night TV and we see an ad for a sensor that can do like early prediction of, of water pipes and it's 300 bucks. You and I don't know if it's worth it for our house. But the insurance company knows, oh, it's worth it for him because he's more likely to have it. So early detection for him is, but Charles, it's not, the 300 bucks isn't worth it for him. Okay, so they know. So that means it's in their interest for an insurance company to do this for you. And basically say, look, we have historically, insurance, we've been in the business of pooling risk. So let's say, you know, imagine a village with 100 houses. Rather than each house, let's say, you know, there's a chance for any one house to get struck by lightning and burn down, catastrophic loss. In order to, to protect each other, what people originally did was they just, everyone said, okay, everyone chip in a little bit of money, we'll put in the pot. If anyone suffers a catastrophic loss, we've all, like, we'll all share the risk. Insurance companies came along and said, we'll do that for you. And so we'll share the risk and then we'll transfer it over to us, the insurance company. So you don't have any more, we have it. So they pool risk, they transfer risk, but they don't minimize, they don't reduce risk. And now they're in the position where they can do it. They have these super good predictions and they can help you reduce risk. Um, but they're structured in a way that, for example, the agents whose job is to go out and sell premiums, the last thing they want to do is say, hey, I, you know, I'm going to subsidize a water monitor for you so it can reduce your risk. And if we reduce your risk, then we can reduce your premiums. If we reduce your premiums, we reduce my bonus. Nobody wants to do that. So we have a system that's been optimized and designed for a world that, where that wasn't possible. Now that it's possible, somebody needs to tear down the whole thing and rebuild it from scratch and say, in the insurance industry, Yes, we pool risk. Yes, we transfer risk. But most importantly, we reduce risk. We're going to be your risk manager because we know more about your house than you do. But that you need 100 Travis Kalanicks to kind of knock down the existing. And you ask, well, how can you do it better? 
One way, and as far as I can tell, this is happening in the US uh, in particular, is they are working with the regulators. So as opposed to Uber that was working kind of around the regulators, they're working with the regulators. The downside is Uber's got the job done and they're out there driving people around today and the insurance companies are still slowly going through. Their, you know, my guess is at the pace we're going, we won't have this at scale for another decade. Right, okay. And uh, I mean, the example so far, transportation, which they do make your life better, maybe in some sense, since they are, are literally life-saving, um, you know, if deployed correctly. But to you, because I, I hear some of the frustration uh, in your voice of there's a misalignment. We know the promised land, but we can't get there because we're so entrenched. What is the industry uh, that you look at and you go, we know what to do and AI can do it, but we can't get there? What's healthcare. the most? Healthcare. Healthcare okay. is the biggest prize. I mean, there's, there, are, there are many big prizes out there, but there's nothing bigger than healthcare. And if you look around the healthcare system, so much of healthcare is uh, infrastructure, expensive infrastructure to deal with uncertainty. So think of all the times that people are in, in taking up hospital beds under observation, because we don't know. We think they're fine, but we don't know. That's uncertainty. Think of all the, the people that are walking around, um, and if we had early detection of a problem, uh, they could be cared for at a much lower cost way at home uh, before they arrive at Emerge. There's so many things that uh, a f like a full overhaul of healthcare. And, and remember, the other thing about AIs is, is they're they're much cheaper than docs or nurses, and they are broadly accessible. So even if you're in remote parts of the country, um, you can get you know early detection and and potentially preventative care. Uh, before you before something goes wrong, and then you you know you need to fly into a city uh, to to be cared for. Um, you know, probably the biggest example that everybody in this room is sadly uh, familiar with is COVID. You know, I think the biggest mistake that the entire global health system made with COVID is that the world treated COVID as a health problem. When we started COVID in, in March of 2020, when it came to, to North America, uh, at that time, depending where you were, there was roughly one in 2,000 people infected. For the one person out of 2,000 that was infected, COVID was genuinely a health problem. For the other 1,999 who were not infected, they were perfectly fine. COVID was not a health problem. Like they, were, they were healthy, and the, but the problem was that it wasn't a health problem, it was an information problem because in the, in, in the absence of the information of who the one person was that was infected, when we didn't know that information, we treated all 2,000 like they could be infected. And that's what shut down the world economy. Because we, we said, okay, well, we don't know, so we're just gonna assume that you probably could be infected, so just stay home and, you know, and uh, social distance and mask and all the rest of it, even though 1,999 of you are fine. That was, it was, COVID was an information problem. The, the, you know, the, for one in 2000 was a health problem, but for the, the vast majority and the part that shut down the world economy, that part was an information problem. It was uncertainty. And if we could have resolved the uncertainty, then we could have managed COVID in a totally different way. We would have put much more care for the people who are infected, and the rest of the world would be able to carry on and uh, you know, continue going to school and, and work and vacation and all the things people were otherwise doing. So my point here is uh, like that is a health care uh, example that illustrates at scale a massive uh, productivity gain if we had had high fidelity prediction. Hmm. Okay, that's good. So when, when you're going out and giving these talks in this period and, and you're describing the opportunities and you're describing even some of the, the, the programs you're working on, like what's the one takeaway for, for a business audience that is not a technology company? What do you want the person in the back row to walk away thinking differently about, also maybe acting upon uh, af after hearing you speak? I think, the, you know, the most important thing is I feel like there are two types of responses once people get it. So I think the majority of people won't get it. 
in the sense that, you know, I'll do my best to explain, but it's very hard to think about um, what does it mean to have a machine that can do these very high fidelity predictions, uh, taking lots of multimodal data. So by multimodal, what I mean is, you know, for a very long time, we've been used to the only time we can do statistics is when we have like numbers in an Excel spreadsheet. Whereas now we, all the data can come in, can be videos and pictures and you know, heat sensor data, like all kinds of data coming in. And take all of those different forms, multimodal, and use that to make very high fidelity predictions. So I think a lot of people will sort of just process what that means. But then for those that do, I think there's the kind that will say, I'm terrified. And then the other kind, and this is what I'm hoping, like in terms of the Lavin presentations that I am going to be giving now with the new book, is I'm hoping to move as many people into this category as possible, which is that they all of a sudden realize we are in a very unique moment in human history. Like we'll only ever be in this moment once. None of our ancestors were in it, will be in it. And none of our successors will be in it. Because by the, you know, we're, in, we're here at the moment where, where, it, where this went from not being possible to being possible. And so there'll be a flourishing of ideas. We, everybody sitting in this room, we've lived through that twice already. We lived through it once in the late 90s when this thing came along and it was called the internet. And so we all went from a world without internet to internet. And we all went from a world of uh, no mobile to mobile. Both of those were, you know, transformational. And this one will arguably be even bigger than either of those, because in this one, we've got machines that can um, do these things that effectively give us this very enhanced cognitive capability. And, um, and so, so my, what I hope people take away is that there's an opportunity to be creative. And, it, and you don't have to be an AI person. Like think of all the people that um, are involved in all types of, you know, were involved in bringing Uber to life. Whether or not you like Uber, there's like so many elements. It's such a kind of a creative project. Um, and that will be true across every domain. There'll be no domain left untouched. Think of like the internet. Like think of what's one industry that wasn't materially impacted by the internet. I don't think there are any. And, um, I know everybody sitting here saying, I'm sure I'll think of one, I'm sure I'll think of one. Uh, <clears throat> but it's hard. So, um, so I hope what people will take away is that, that we're living in a very unique moment in time and there's a real opportunity, no matter what your passion and your interest is, is to think about the entire world in whatever thing I'm interested in has been designed and, and optimized for an environment that didn't have this capability. Now this capability has arrived. How can this, what can we do that wasn't possible before? Certainly I think every, at every company, every senior leadership team uh, will be thinking about this or they, sh you know, over, they should be. Um, but I think even just the people in their everyday lives. That's good. Uh, can I just ask a, a very last question, which is the perennial AI question about how AI displaces skilled labor, unskilled labor, white collar work. It's the question that's almost like the second question always asked. Where do we stand in 2023 with regards to that? And, and how do you talk to people who are afraid that that might happen? Well, I would say that the what I hear most commonly when, when that comes up and other, you know, other people are speaking on it, that people say um, it frees up time. In other words, so, you know, it's, 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 it's a tool, it's not replacing people, it frees up time for people to do other things. And I would say so far, that's probably reasonably accurate for a lot of occupations. It's not for taxi drivers. Uh, many taxi drivers will tell you that they are facing a lot of pain. Uh, especially if they had put a lot of their personal wealth into a, a, a taxi medallion or something. Uh, the value of that has gone, has gone down significantly. Uh, so there are small pockets, I, th I feel, of people who, and also depending on their age and their education level, some people are able to go and change their job and, and, or upskill or something, but some are like, you know what, I'm 50 and I, you know, English is my second language, 
and I just don't feel like there's a lot of places for me to go. And so I think it's been very hard for, for, for some people. And then there are other people who get a tool like the brand new one, ChatGBT, and they're, they're, all, they're kind of finding all these new business opportunities that they can do with that, and that they're going to employ a lot of people because of it, and so on. Um, you know, I'm, economists often say, they preface a thing like, well, the thing I'm about to say is by, with, in the long run. And, what, the, and what, what, what happens when you say in the long run? is in the long run, basically, we're an adaptive species and we'll adapt and, and we'll sort of develop you know, things and jobs and, and training and skills that take advantage of this new technology. I think that's more or less indisputable. Along the way, some people will benefit a lot from the opportunities, and I think some people will, will be harmed a lot. And, um, and I don't think we do society really a great service by sweeping that under the rug and saying, don't worry, like, you know, uh, everyone's going to be fine. I think the taxi drivers have shown us not everyone's going to be fine. Um, and so we need to make sure that we have mechanisms uh, for those types of people. And at the same time, there's no one's going to put the genie back in the bottle. And so they'll also, how can we best utilize this new technology for things that make overall society better. Right, well, let's end it there. Thanks, man. <laughs>